Book One, Chapters Eight through Eleven of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book One, Chapters Eight through Eleven. Chapter Eight that when there was a famine in Canaan, Abram went thence into Egypt, and after he had continued there a while, he returned back again. Now after this, when a famine had invaded the land of Canaan, and Abram had discovered that the Egyptians were in a flourishing condition, he was disposed to go down to them, both to partake of the plenty they enjoyed, and to become an auditor of their priests, and to know what they said concerning the gods designing either to follow them if they had better notions than he, or to convert them into a better way, if his own notions proved the truest. Now seeing he was to take Sarai with him, and was afraid of the madness of the Egyptians with regard to women, lest the king should kill him on occasion of his wife's great beauty, he contrived this device. He pretended to be her brother, and directed her in a dissembling way to pretend the same for he said it would be for their benefit. Now, as soon as he came into Egypt, it happened to Abram as he supposed it would, for the fame of his wife's beauty was greatly talked of, for which reason Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, would not be satisfied with what was reported of her, but would needs see her himself, and was preparing to enjoy her. But God put a stop to his unjust inclinations by sending upon him a distemper, and a sedition against his government. And when he inquired of the priests how he might be freed from these calamities, they told him that this his miserable condition was derived from the wrath of God, upon account of his inclinations to abuse the stranger's wife. He then, out of fear, asked Sarai who she was, and who it was that she brought along with her. And when he had found out the truth, he excused himself to Abram, that supposing the woman to be his sister and not his wife, he set his affections on her, as desiring an affinity with him by marrying her, but not as incited by lust to abuse her. He also made him a large present in money, and gave him leave to enter into conversation with the most learned among the Egyptians, from which conversation his virtue and his reputation became more conspicuous than they had been before. For whereas the Egyptians were formerly addicted to different customs, and despised one another's sacred and accustomed rites, and were very angry one with another on that account, Abram conferred with each of them, and confuting the reasonings they made use of, every one for their own practices, demonstrated that such reasonings were vain and void of truth. Whereupon he was admired by them in those conferences as a very wise man, and one of great sagacity, when he discoursed on any subject he undertook, and this not only in understanding it, but in persuading other men also to assent to him. He communicated to them arithmetic, and delivered to them the science of astronomy, for before Abram came into Egypt they were unacquainted with those parts of learning, for that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt, and from thence to the Greeks also. As soon as Abram was come back into Canaan, he parted the land between him and Lot, upon account of the tumultuous behavior of the shepherds, concerning the pastures wherein they should feed their flocks. However, he gave Lot his option, or leave, to choose which lands he would take, and he took himself what the other left, which were the lower grounds at the foot of the mountains. And he himself dwelt in Hebron, which is a city seven years more ancient than Tunis of Egypt. But Lot possessed the land of the plain and the river Jordan, not far from the city of Sodom, which was then a fine city, but is now destroyed by the will and wrath of God, the cause of which I shall show in its proper place hereafter. Chapter 9. The Destruction of the Sodomites by the Assyrian Wall At this time, when the Assyrians had the dominion over Asia, the people of Sodom were in a flourishing condition, both as to riches and the number of their youth. There were five kings that managed the affairs of the country, Ballas, Barsus, Senabar, and Sumabor, 
with the king of Bela. And each king led on his own troops. And the Assyrians made war upon them, and, dividing their army into four parts, fought against them. Now every part of the army had its own commander, and when the battle was joined, the Assyrians were conquerors, and imposed a tribute on the kings of the Sodomites, who submitted to this slavery twelve years, and so long they continued to pay their tribute. But on the thirteenth year they rebelled, and then the army of the Assyrians came upon them under their commanders Amraphel, Ariach, Chodorloomer, and Tidal. These kings had laid waste all Syria, and overthrown the offspring of the giants. And when they were come over against Sodom, they pitched their camp at the vale called the Slime Pits, for at that time there were pits in that place. But now, upon the destruction of the city of Sodom, that vale became Lake Asphaltites, as it is called. However, concerning this lake we shall speak more presently. Now, when the Sodomites joined battle with the Assyrians, and the fight was very obstinate, many of them were killed, and the rest were carried captive, among which captives was Lot, who had come to assist the Sodomites. Chapter 10. How Abram fought with the Assyrians, and overcame them, and saved the Sodomite prisoners, and took from the Assyrians the prey they had gotten. When Abram heard of their calamity, he was at once afraid for Lot his kinsmen, and pitied the Sodomites, his friends and neighbors. And thinking it proper to afford them assistance, he did not delay it, but marched hastily, and the fifth night fell upon the Assyrians near Dan, for that is the name of the other spring of Jordan. And before they could arm themselves, he slew some as they were in their beds, before they could suspect any harm and others, who were not yet gone to sleep, but were so drunk they could not fight, ran away. Abram pursued after them, till, on the second day, he drove them in a body unto Hobah, a place belonging to Damascus, and thereby demonstrated that victory does not depend on multitude and the number of hands, but the alacrity and courage of soldiers overcome the most numerous bodies of men, while he got the victory over so great an army, with no more than three hundred and eighteen of his servants, and three of his friends. But all those that fled returned home ingloriously. So Abram, when he had saved the captive Sodomites, who had been taken by the Assyrians, and Lot also his kinsmen, returned home in peace. Now the king of Sodom met him at a certain place, which they called the king's dale, where Melchizedek, king of the city Salem, received him. That name signifies the righteous king, and such he was without dispute, insomuch that, on this account, he was made the priest of God. However, they afterward called Salem Jerusalem. Now this Melchizedek supplied Abram's army in an hospitable manner, and gave them provisions in abundance, and as they were feasting he began to praise him, and to bless God for subduing his enemies under him. And when Abram gave him the tenth part of his prey, he accepted of the gift. But the king of Sodom desired Abram to take the prey, but entreated that he might have those men restored to him whom Abram had saved from the Assyrians, because they belonged to him. But Abram would not do so, nor would make any other advantage of that prey than what his servants had eaten but still insisted that he should afford a part to his friends that had assisted him in the battle. The first of them was called Eschol, and then Enner and Mambre. And God commended his virtue, and said, Thou shalt not, however, lose the rewards thou hast deserved to receive by such thy glorious actions. He answered, And what advantage will it be to me to have such rewards, when I have none to enjoy them after me? for he was hitherto childless. And God promised that he should have a son, and that his posterity should be very numerous, insomuch that their number should be like the stars. When he heard that, he offered a sacrifice to God, as he commanded him. The manner of the sacrifice was this. He took an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram in like manner of three years old, and a turtle-dove, and a pigeon, and as he was enjoined, he divided the three former, but the birds he did not divide. 
after which, before he built his altar, where the birds of prey flew about, as desirous of blood, a divine voice came to him, declaring that their neighbors would be grievous to his posterity when they should be in Egypt for four hundred years, during which time they should be afflicted, but afterwards should overcome their enemies, should conquer the Canaanites in war, and possess themselves of their land and of their cities. Now Abram dwelt near the oak called Ogages. The place belongs to Canaan, not far from the city of Hebron. But being uneasy at his wife's barrenness, he entreated God to grant that he might have male issue. And God required of him to be of good courage, and said that he would add to all the rest of the benefits that he had bestowed upon him, ever since he led him out of Mesopotamia, the gift of children. Accordingly, Sarai, at God's command, brought to his bed one of her handmaidens, a woman of Egyptian descent, in order to obtain children by her. And when this handmaid was with child, she triumphed and ventured to affront Sarai, as if the dominion were to come to a son to be born of her. But when Abram resigned her into the hand of Sarai to punish her, she contrived to fly away, as not able to bear the instances of Sarai's severity to her and she entreated God to have compassion on her. Now a divine angel met her as she was going forward in the wilderness, and bid her return to her master and mistress, for if she would submit to that wise advice, she would live better hereafter. For that the reason of her being in such a miserable case was this, that she had been ungrateful and arrogant towards her mistress. He also told her that if she disobeyed God, and went on still in her way, she should perish. But if she would turn back, she would become the mother of a son who would reign over that country. These admonitions she obeyed, and returned to her master and mistress, and obtained forgiveness. A little while afterwards she bare Ismael, which may be interpreted heard of God, because God had heard his mother's prayer. The forementioned son was born to Abram when he was eighty-six years old. But when he was ninety-nine, God appeared to him and promised him that he should have a son by Sarai, and commanded that his name should be Isaac, and showed him that from this son should spring great nations and kings, and that they should obtain all the land of Canaan by war from Sidon to Egypt. But he charged him, in order to keep his posterity unmixed with others, that they should be circumcised in the flesh of their foreskin, and that this should be done on the eighth day after they were born, the reason of which circumcision I will explain in another place. And Abram inquiring also concerning Ismael, whether he should live or not, God signified to him that he should live to be very old, and should be the father of great nations. Abram therefore gave thanks to God for these blessings, and then he and all his family, and his son Ismael, were circumcised immediately the son being that day thirteen years of age, and he ninety-nine. Chapter 11. How God overthrew the nation of the Sodomites out of his wrath against them for their sins. About this time the Sodomites grew proud, on account of their riches and great wealth. They became unjust towards men, and impious towards God, insomuch that they did not call to mind the advantages they received from him. They hated strangers, and abused themselves with sodomitical practices. God was therefore much displeased at them, and determined to punish them for their pride, and to overthrow their city, and to lay waste their country, until there should be neither plant nor fruit grow out of it. When God had thus resolved concerning the Sodomites, Abraham, as he sat by the oak of Mambre, at the door of his tent, saw three angels and thinking them to be strangers, he rose up and saluted them, and desired they should accept of an entertainment and abide with him, to which, when they agreed, he ordered cakes of meal to be made presently. And when he had slain a calf, he roasted it, and brought it to them, as they sat under the oak. Now they made a show of eating, and besides, they asked him about his wife Sarah, where she was, and when he said she was within, they said they would come again hereafter, and find her become a mother. Upon which the woman laughed, and said it was impossible she should bear children, since she was ninety years of age, and her husband was a hundred. 
Then they concealed themselves no longer, but declared that they were angels of God, and that one of them was sent to inform them about the child, and two of the overthrow of Sodom. When Abraham heard this, he grieved for the Sodomites, and he rose up and besought God for them, and entreated him that he would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And when God had replied that there was no good man among the Sodomites, for if there were but ten such men among them, he would not punish any of them for their sins, Abraham held his peace. And the angels came to the city of the Sodomites, and Lot entreated them to accept of a lodging with him, for he was a very generous and hospitable man, and one that had learned to imitate the goodness of Abraham. Now when the Sodomites saw the young men to be of beautiful countenances, and this to an extraordinary degree, and that they took up their lodgings with Lot, they resolved themselves to enjoy these beautiful boys by force and violence. And when Lot exhorted them to sobriety, and not to offer anything immodest to the strangers, but to have regard to their lodging in his house, and promised that if their inclinations could not be governed, he would expose his daughters to their lust, instead of these strangers. Neither thus were they made ashamed. But God was much displeased at their impudent behavior, so that he both smote those men with blindness, and condemned the Sodomites to universal destruction. But Lot, upon God's informing him of the future destruction of the Sodomites, went away, taking with him his wife and daughters, who were two and still virgins. For those that were betrothed to them were above the thoughts of going, and deemed that Lot's words were trifling. God then cast a thunderbolt upon the city, and set it on fire with its inhabitants, and laid waste the country with the like burning, as I formerly said when I wrote the Jewish war. But Lot's wife continually turning back to view the city as she went from it, and being too nicely inquisitive what would become of it, although God had forbidden her so to do, was changed into a pillar of salt. For I have seen it, and it remains to this day. Now he and his daughters fled to a certain small place, encompassed with the fire, and settled in it. It is to this day called Zoar, for that is the word which the Hebrews use for a small thing. There it was that he lived a miserable life, on account of his having no company, and his want of provisions. But his daughters, thinking that all mankind were destroyed, approached to their father, though taking care not to be perceived. This they did, that humankind might not utterly fail, and they bare sons. The son of the elder was named Moab, which denotes one derived from his father. The younger bare Ammon, which name denotes one derived from a kinsman. The former of whom was the father of the Moabites, which is even still a great nation. The latter was the father of the Ammonites, and both of them were inhabitants of Celesyria and such was the departure of Lot from among the Sodomites. End of Book 1, Chapters 8-11